Hello, friends! Today, I want to dive into a system that is easily ported into your old school essentials campaign to make weapon selection fun and dynamic. <clears throat> Beck me, weapon mastery! Mm hmm. Beck me, as many of you know, is a cousin of sorts to old school essentials, OSE being based on BX, which was an immediate precursor to Beck me. Just for clarity, Beckme is shorthand specifically for the version of Dungeons & Dragons encompassed by the basic, expert, companion, master, and immortal rule sets. It was in the master rules that they introduced a fleshed-out weapon system to spice up variety. So, roll the opener, and let's have at it! As regular viewers know, I'm a strong supporter of old school essentials. But as a young apprentice mage, I first cut my teeth on Beckme. Shortly after discovering the hobby, I moved quickly on to other systems, leaving Beckme behind. In retrospect, I wish I'd played with it more and mastered it. The first wonderful thing you'll notice about Beckme Weapon Mastery is that it's already 100% compatible with old school essentials. No tinkering to fit the rules is needed. The two systems have the same basic DNA. So, let's go over the process, step by step. The first thing you need to do is give weapon choices to all of the players. In old school essentials and Beckme, all characters are assumed to have basic knowledge in all the weapons they can use, and that's that. Fighters can use all weapons. Halflings can only use small weapons, etc. They are assumed to be proficient with everything on their list. Mm -hmm. This changes when you implement weapon mastery. Instead, each character gets a limited number of weapon choices, basically the same as weapon proficiencies in many other games, with which they assign their character a skill in specific weapons. First level characters must use their choices for different weapons. Only as they level may they start using these choices to enhance their existing skills with specific weapons. Further, for each aspect or function of a weapon, the character must put a weapon choice into their skill with the weapon. So, for instance, a bastard sword, which can be wielded with one or two hands, would use two choices, one for each of the functions. The rules do not specify whether this is true for weapons that can be used as thrown weapons and melee weapons, but it would stand to reason that this logic also applies. Mm -hmm. Each class gets a number of weapon choices as per the chart. Fighters get four weapon choices at first level, other classes get two. Demihumans neither use nor gain weapon choices, and are instead considered to have basic proficiency in all weapons normally available to them. Notice how fighters have their own progression chart. Fighters will, over the course of their careers, be able to learn more weapon choices than other classes. That covers the basics of weapon choices. But a character doesn't just magically have the knowledge beamed into their brain. They must train for it. Mm hmm. When a player gains their new weapon choice, they must find a mentor to teach them. The cost, time, and chance of learning the skill are all dependent on the learner's skill and the teacher's skill. The first chart shows you how much time and money you must spend in order to learn based on your current level of proficiency. For instance, someone who is unskilled must spend one week and 100 gold pieces to learn the weapon. Becoming an expert requires four weeks and 2,000 gold pieces, that being 500 gold pieces per week. Once you know your training time, you must now consult the second chart to find out what the percentage chance of learning your skill is. This process is a little more involved. First, you cross-reference your current level of skill with the skill level of your mentor. So, let's say a warrior who is considered skilled, meaning he has already put two choices into a particular weapon skill, wants to become an expert, the next level up. He must train with someone who is at least the same level of skill as he is for a chance of success. You now cross-reference the student's knowledge with the mentor's knowledge and find the percentage chance of learning. It's possible to learn from someone who is the student's equal, but with only a mere 1% chance of imparting the knowledge. 
An expert would have a 40% chance, a master has a 60% chance, and a grandmaster has an 80% chance of successfully mentoring the student to the expert level. At first glance, it might seem silly that you can upgrade your ability from a mentor of equal skill, but I like to think of it like this. Rather than studying with a mentor, per se, you are studying with an equal, but someone who has a different perspective on the skill. And in adding their knowledge to yours, you might have a breakthrough by combining techniques. It's a mere 1% at first, but with an additional chance with each subsequent peer you study with. But that becomes your path to mastery for characters who can't find someone of a higher skill to train them. Mm -hmm. After you've completed half of the training period, you make your role to see if you've learned the skill. If the role succeeds, the student simply completes the remainder of the training period and gains the knowledge. If the role fails, then the mentor realizes that the student isn't ready. The character has the choice of finishing the training period or stopping to find a new mentor, then starting over. If they opt to continue the training, then they gain a 10% bonus with the role when they train with the next mentor. If they stop, then they can start training immediately under a new mentor at the list odds of success based on the new mentor's skill. Well, that covers training. Let's look at some of the nuances of weapon mastery. Weapon mastery adds two categories of targets, primary and secondary. This is an indicator as to where your weapon will be more effective. The first category grants primary advantage against missile weapons or monsters. Specifically, this refers to two-hand missile-style weapons such as crossbows and bows, and creatures with natural weaponry. The next category grants primary advantage against handheld weapons. This includes all melee weapons as well as missile weapons that are thrown or only used with a single hand. And finally, some weapons count as primary against all weapon types. There are six levels of mastery. Each represents a level of ability based on how many weapon choices you've put into a weapon. Each level dictates the mechanical effects in-game that come into play when the character uses said weapon. Unskilled. Zero weapon choices. What do you think you're going to do with that, wizard? <laughs> Loser. This means the character has zero training in the weapon. Unskilled use of a weapon means that the weapon damage is always half. This applies only to weapon damage. Modifiers for magic, strength, etc. are not adjusted. Note that all characters are considered to have basic proficiency, regardless of class, in burning oil and holy water. Mm -hmm. Basic. One weapon choice. Ow? Nah, you're still a loser. This is the baseline skill as per the normal rules. No bonuses or penalties are applied. Skilled. Two weapon choices. Come on, hit me with your best shot, loser. I don't like this game anymore. A step up from basic. Skilled use of a weapon grants a plus two to strike against primary targets and plus one against secondary targets. Specific weapons will have additional perks and abilities that apply, but the aforementioned bonuses apply to all weapons. Additionally, skilled, expert, master, and grandmaster gain the ability to demoralize enemies with a despair roll. I'll get to that ability shortly. Expert. Three weapon choices. Please don't hurt me. Really getting into the good stuff now. On top of specific weapon traits as per the chart, all experts can use their despair more effectively and gain plus four to strike against primary targets and plus two against secondary targets. Master. Four weapon choices. <laughs> okay, one hit. I, I can take one hit. In addition to further enhancing the despair ability and more weapon traits, the master gains plus six to strike against primary targets and plus four against secondary. Grand Master! Five weapon choices. One moment, minions. That was a little fast. Let's see the slow mo replay and the wizard cam on this one. Mm. 
Yeesh. Grandmasters really don't mess around, do they? Uh, I think we should let the wizard continue his dissertation. Imp, come along. Plus eight to primary targets, plus six to secondary, plus all of the previously mentioned perks. The ability to cause despair in opponents becomes available once a character has put their second weapon choice into a weapon to become skilled. As mentioned, the ability is available to all weapons. Once per fight, the weapon master may attempt to cause despair. The DM will adjudicate what constitutes a despair roll, which can include the weapon master attempting to show off or intimidate enemies actively. By the book triggers include inflicting maximum damage, avoiding all damage through use of special defensive abilities of a weapon, i.e. deflection, or disarming two or more enemies in a single round. The number of creatures affected will be determined by the skill level of the weapon master. Unskilled and basic mastery do not allow for a weapon despair check. Skilled opponents can affect up to four hit dice or levels of enemies. Experts can affect up to eight hit dice. Masters affect up to 12 hit dice, and grandmasters affect up to 16 hit dice of creatures. Always start with the creatures with the lowest hit dice first and work your way up. Once you run out of your allotted hit dice to effect, no more creatures need to make the check. Creatures affected by despair make an immediate morale check. Failure means they will surrender or flee as the situation dictates. Despair does not work against creatures of animal intelligence or less. Yes. Player characters can be affected by despair as well. Since morale rolls don't apply to PCs, instead, if a player character is affected, they must make a saving throw versus death ray. Success means they ignore the despair effect. Failure means they must withdraw for d6 rounds. Aside from the despair effect, each weapon has a variety of options. So... No two weapons are completely identical. Let's take a look at the Weapon Mastery chart in the Rules Cyclopedia. As you can see, there's a lot to parse here. Various symbols, level perks, etc. Let's start with the legend, so we have a primer as to the symbols. P will tell you what the weapon's primary target type is. S will indicate the secondary target type. The target types are... H for handheld weapons and thrown weapons and single-hand missile devices such as slings or crossbows used with one hand. M is for missile devices requiring two hands, as well as monsters' natural attacks. An A indicates all target types are considered primary. A symbol with a single hand pointing means the weapon is a one-handed weapon. The symbol with two hands pointing at each other indicates two-handed weapons. A circle and star indicates that the weapon may be used with a shield. An arrow indicates a missile device exclusively, as opposed to a weapon that can be used in melee as well as a thrown weapon. A starburst is a melee weapon that can also be thrown. A cross is a melee weapon that is rarely or never thrown. The symbol similar to a compass point indicates that the weapon may be used during a mounted charge. A small bullet point means a small weapon. A white circle means a medium-sized weapon. A black circle means a large-sized weapon. The single or double asterisk means there are special addendums to these weapons listed elsewhere. A check mark means you can set the weapon to receive a charge. Once you know the legend, you can spot at a glance the specifics of any given weapon. Let's look at the two-handed sword. First, it's under the category of handheld use only, meaning it's among a class of weapons that you can't use as a missile weapon. Looking at the symbols, you see that its primary target is M, meaning it's best used against people wielding missile devices and against monsters with natural weapons. The two hands pointing at each other tell us that it's a two-handed weapon, you know, in case the name two-handed sword didn't tip you off, and the cross tells us it's never thrown, the black circle that it's a large weapon. The cost is 15 gold pieces and counts as 100 coins for encumbrance purposes. In the next column, we see various damage levels based on the skill of the wielder. Basic damage is d10, and as with all weapons, that's divided in half for unskilled use. Skilled damage jumps to 2d6 plus 1, from 1 to 10 to 3 to 13 with an average of 8, not too shabby. Expert damage is 2d8 plus 2, 
Master damage is where the primary and secondary categories open up further. Against the weapon's primary targets, you now do 3d6 plus 3, whereas against your secondary targets, you remain at 2d8, albeit with a plus 3. And finally, Grand Master damage is 3d6 plus 6 against primary targets, and 3d6 plus 2 against secondary. These damage listings, of course, are only base damage. A warrior's strength score, or magic weapons, will add to this as normal. Pretty chunky indeed! The next column over would indicate applicable defense bonuses for the weapon. The two-handed sword is an offensive beast, but offers no extra protection defensively in this category. But let's look at the staff, listed immediately above, so you can see how it works. There is an AC bonus, followed by a slash and a number. This means the listed AC bonus applies for the listed number of attacks each round. Note that also these defensive bonuses only apply to a weapon's primary type. So, an expert staff user would gain a two-point armor class bonus for the first two attacks that come their way each melee round, where the Grandmaster gets a four-point AC bonus against the first four attacks each round. Easy peasy? The final column indicates which special abilities the weapon grants. As previously stated, all weapons can create the despair effect, so that isn't listed here, but specific weapon effects are noted. In the case of our two-handed sword, starting with skilled levels, using this weapon has a chance to outright stun enemies and deflect specific attacks, the number in the parentheses indicating how many each round. Other weapons may allow you to disarm opponents or give you additional attacks. The chapter covering weapon mastery reviews the process for each of these, but this chart here gives you all of the info in one quickly referenced stat block. In going over this, I did notice a few mistakes that I feel are easily addressed. For instance, you'll note that the staff's primary target lists an A, which should indicate that it's equally effective against all weapons. But in the breakdown, it lists a secondary damage category. This oversight appears to be in both the Master Rulebook and the Rule Cyclopedia, suggesting it was an oversight the editors didn't catch. Or they didn't playtest this thing, also a possibility. Nonetheless, you really have two options. Ignore the secondary category entirely, or assume that there was meant to be a primary category and assign one, either M or H. My inclination would be to do the latter. The two categories are listed, suggesting to me that the all category was an oversight. In fact, looking at the others that are mislabeled, they all seem to be in this particular row, and aside from the staff, all of the others are variations on shields. So it's not unreasonable to assume that all of these, including the staff, are meant as primary weapons against Category H, handheld weapons. But that's just my opinion. A few special weapons stand out as they have further specific rules. The blowgun, net, bola, whip, and blackjack. They all have their listings in the master weapon chart, but turning to the next page you'll see additional tables to resolving their effects. It's not too complicated, as you can see, just additional information for the special nature of these weapons. The blackjack, for instance, generates a chance of knocking out or stunning enemies. A bola can entangle or even strangle a foe. Very potent indeed. Once you've implemented weapon mastery, you must now consider that other creatures could also have access to these talents. The same rules apply, of course. A monster must find someone to teach it as normal. Naturally, only monsters capable of wielding weapons can learn these abilities. But what a fun way to enhance an orc tribal chief or a marauding hobgoblin. Monsters gaining mastery are limited in a couple of ways. Unlike PCs, the monster in question will be limited by their base intellect. No monster can attain grand mastery. Mastery is the highest level, and even then only if their intelligence is 18. This chart indicates the maximum level of mastery according to the intelligence of an enemy. In Beckme, a monster's intelligence is listed with their stat block in the monster entry, and a cursory glance of monster entries would indicate that very few indeed have an intellect of higher than 11. But remember that this represents the average intelligence for that monster type. The DM can always assume that a monster with an exceptional skill is one of the outliers and adjudicate accordingly. Now, for old school essentials, you'll note that monster intelligence is not listed in their stat blocks, meaning the DM will simply have to decide whether a creature is smart enough for a level in mastery, or just toss the whole intellect requirement out the window in favor of another metric. For my part, I would say use hit dice as an indicator, 
allowing a level in mastery for every threshold of hit dice, much like the rules for demihumans who can upgrade a weapon skill at levels 4, 8, and 12. In any event, as a DM, I recommend not overusing this for monsters. Monsters with weapon mastery should indeed be very rare and special. Mm -hmm. So, I've outlined the basics here for your consideration. There are a lot of great ideas in here, and easily ported over to old-school essentials without any real issue. I do feel upon examination that, while this is a massive boost to fighters, non-fighters advance a little too fast with the number of weapon choices they obtain. It's not until level 19 that fighters gain their first extra weapon selection above what other classes can gain. Level 19 is a very long way, depending on how generous the DM is with XP. Theoretically, a thief with their rapid advancement could attain mastery in a weapon sooner than a fighter would, which doesn't quite sit right with me. Any character reaching level 15 can attain Grand Mastery. It might be worth limiting non-fighters in some way or boosting early choices available to fighters, something worth thinking about if you implement the system. It's also important for a DM to suss out just how rare it is finding a mentor for upgrading the skills, especially at the Master and Grand Master levels. Finding such an individual could be made into a whole quest in and of itself. I am curious as to the design intent of a Grand Master teaching a Grand Master with a 1% chance of learning. This implies the existence of a level above Grand Master. Here's something for DMs to think about. Like wizards who can invent new spells, perhaps warriors can use this metric to consult with fellow Grand Masters and add a new technique not usually available to the weapon. Hmm. As a system, the effect on fighters is undeniable, however. The power upgrade to warriors will definitely keep players happy. Well, my friends, I hope this dip into Beckme has been illuminating. I've been reviewing the system for possible use in my own games. Well, it's either that or create my own system, which I have been thinking about. Hmm, decisions, decisions. Oh well, I shall have to ponder it further. Until then, my friends, I shall bid you anon. <laughs>